Hello, travelers. Welcome to Oceans Week at Reach the World. My name is Tim, and for over 20 years, Reach the World has inspired youth to become curious, confident, and compassionate global citizens. This week, in partnership with the Explorers Club and in collaboration with ocean advocates around the world, we're sharing kid-friendly stories of ocean exploration, conservation, and wonder with members of our global community. You can find a complete calendar of live stream events and much more at athome.reachtheworld.org. Joining us now is author, marine scientist, and Explorers Club fellow, Dr. Ellen Prager. Dr. Prager has spent many years living and working in the Galapagos Islands, and she's here today to talk about the science behind one of the most fascinating places on Earth. We're also joined today by on-camera students who are eager to ask their questions to Dr. Prager. But if you're watching via the live stream today, please use the YouTube chat bar to let us know where you're watching from and what grade you're in. You can also share any questions you have for Dr. Prager in the YouTube chat bar, and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the next 45 minutes or so. So, all right, it's time to dive into the wonders of the Galapagos Islands. Dr. Prager, welcome to Reach the World. Thank you so much, Tim. I am so excited to be here today to share with you some fun stories and pictures from one of my favorite places in the world, the Galapagos Islands. So I'm gonna take over here and I'm gonna share my screen. So bear with me for just a minute here. Um, get my little PowerPoint here going for you. Here we are. So first thing I wanna show you is, I wanna tell you a little bit more because people always ask me as a marine scientist, what are the, some of the things you've done? So. I've had a very unexpected career path and here's some of the cool things I've gotten to do that maybe for you kids out there, you could do when you get older too. So I was the chief scientist for the world's only undersea research station, the Aquarius Reef Base. And you can see those pictures of an undersea lab. I actually have lived for two weeks underwater in the lab. I've lived underwater twice to study coral reefs. How many of you would like to do that? It was very cool. I've gone out on a tall sailing ship down in some the deep ocean. I have sometimes when things around the world happen, the news people call me. So I've been on CNN and NBC and, and I talk about the oceans. And you might notice in the right on your corner, the name of a movie I know you guys like, Moana. Well, I was a consultant for the movie Moana because they wanted to get things right about what the ocean should look like in the movie. It was one of my best jobs ever. And as you heard, I also write books. I write kids' books, adventure stories, and nonfiction stories. But one of my favorite places where I've worked, as I said, is the Galapagos Islands. Now, most people have heard about the Galapagos Islands because that's where Charles Darwin went on his voyage of the Beagle. And he studied the animals and he came, he was looking at adaptation and how different animals adapt and grow. But my first time in the Galapagos was in the 1980s. And I went there with a team of researchers and we lived in the Galapagos Islands for several months to study the impact of El Nino, which is a climate phenomenon on the corals. And it, back in the 1980s, it was a little bit rough in the Galapagos. We were diving all day in cold water and our showers were, there was no hot water. They smelled, they were cold and they smelled like sulfur. At night when you went to bed and you look up on the ceiling, there were giant spiders on the ceiling. And then when you wake up in the morning, they were gone. Where, where did they go? Food was kind of sparse. We had equipment problems. And then we had a very unexpected problem. When you go out in the field to work in the ocean, you think about, okay, the weather might cause problems, your boat might break down, but we didn't expect this. The young sea lions loved our equipment. Look at this picture. This is a sea lion trying to steal the camera from my buddy who was snorkeling. And they would, they would pull our fins. I actually had a sea lion pull my hair. They would try and steal our equipment. And they had a very favorite thing to do was to swim right up to us like this and they would blow bubbles in your face. <laughs> and they were kind of teasing you like, you're really good underwater. Yeah, you're not so much. So it was the best problem I've ever had in the ocean. So from that work, 
when Celebrity Cruises was going to build small expedition ships for the Galapagos, they called me to help them. And so now I have one of the best jobs in the world. I go to the Galapagos several times a year to help train naturalists. I help develop the programs on board and I get to go down there and see all of the cool things in the Galapagos. So I'm gonna share with you some of my favorite creatures and some really cool photos. So one of the things in the Galapagos that I as a scientist like the best is that when you go down, we get to go snorkeling and we see things like sea turtles, tropical fish, and you see down the, the bottom, that's a white tip reef shark. So you think, oh, those are animals that live in warm water, right? But then before you know it, a penguin swims by. How strange is that, that you have warm tropical species living side by side with something like a penguin? And it is the second smallest penguin in the world, the furthest Northern penguin, and so it's all about the conditions that make the Galapagos that you get such a strange mix. But it's not just the mix. It's also the fact that the animals are so well protected that you can get really close. The limit is about six to eight feet. You're not supposed to get any closer. Well, a little secret, sometimes they come closer to you. But you get so close that you can get close-ups. Like on this picture, you see the face of a blue-footed booby, a land iguana, and that's a male frigate bird with its throat pouch blown up because that's how they try and attract mates. The face of a waved albatross, and of course, one of our favorites, the giant tortoise. And look how they eat. They're not very, very neat and clean. Look at the messy, messy food. Sometimes the animals are so unafraid that they will raise their chicks right close to the trails. And you get to see them, and look at this. This is a chick of a frigate bird, that's in the left. It's actually almost a teenager because you can see the feathers down the back. There's a, a gull on the right with the chick and one of my favorites on the bottom, that is a penguin chick. It was so funny. I was giving this talk once and some of the audience yelled out and says, look, the penguin has an Afro. <laughs> this looks so funny. And sometimes they have very strange, funny behaviors that you never know what they're going to do. So here I am on a Zodiac or an inflatable boat with some passengers, some guests, and we've stopped the engine. It's in neutral, the propeller's not moving, and this sea line comes up. We're in a place called Elizabeth Bay. It's a secluded estuary and lagoon. And here comes the sea lion, and there's water coming through the engine because it's just cooling it. It's, it's salt water, but look at this book. We had never seen a sea lion do this before. Oh my goodness, he comes up behind us and he says, oh, what is that? <gasps> Turns out their whiskers and their muzzle is very sensitive and they love the feeling. He's not drinking the water, but they just like the feeling of the water on their our whiskers and their muzzle. Look at that, isn't that funny? Even the boat drivers who live in the Galapagos were laughing because when they saw the sea lion playing doing this, it was so cute. So we'd never seen that before. So for those of you who don't know, the Galapagos, a little more, they're located about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador, around the equator, and they're a group of islands. The Galapagos is not just one island, it's what we call an archipelago, or a group of islands, and they straddle the equator, which is the zero latitude line. Now the Galapagos are built by volcanoes. This is a video of a real eruption in 2015 from one of the celebrity ships. And the, the volcanoes over time after eruption, eruption, they build up the Galapagos Islands, very similar to how Hawaiian islands are built. And so I'm gonna play you a quick video about how, how these islands are built. Let's see, there we go, very quick. 600 miles to the west of Ecuador lay the Galapagos Islands. It is a place born of fire, the result of volcanic upheavals that build and shape the land. The Galapagos are the product of one of the world's mysterious hotspots, where deep below in the Earth's interior it is hot, hotter than the surrounding Earth. By this heat and lower density, magma or molten rock rises towards the surface. It flows through fractures already present or breaks its way upward. Once the magma reaches the surface, it becomes lava. 
In the Galapagos, as in Hawaii, the lava is made of basalt, poor in silica, but rich in iron and magnesium. This type of lava flows faster and greater distances. Over time, multiple eruptions of lava create the towering and wide shield volcanoes of the Galapagos. Here, eruptions can eject ash and rock into the air, which form cinder, scoria, or spatter cones. The lava winds its way over land and sometimes reaches the ocean. Along the way, it creates tunnels or strange ropey surfaces. In the Galapagos, like Hawaii, the underlying hotspot is stationary, but at the surface, the Earth's tectonic plates move and the volcanoes are transported away from the hotspot. Eventually, the volcanoes become inactive and cool. The islands sink into the underlying mantle, and erosion and weathering wear away at the surface. Over time, vegetation takes hold and spreads across the islands. Animals arrive and populate the shores. After millions of years, the island's volcanic origin is hidden from view. So, the volcanoes build up the islands, but then what happens is all around the, from the islands, ocean, different ocean currents come down and impinge or converge on the islands. And that's what creates some of these different conditions. And there's one very special ocean current that's actually beneath the sea and it flows underwater. It hits the base of the volcanoes that make up the Galapagos and it pushes water upwards towards the surface. And with it, comes water that is rich in nutrients, which are act like fertilizer, and you get the growth of phytoplankton and zooplankton and plankton are very small critters. And here's a really cool image through a microscope of what plankton looks like. And so you get around the islands, you get all this plankton growing, zooplankton with their drifting animals and phytoplankton, which are drifting plants. Look at that, it's amazing. This is what it looks like under a microscope. And then it turns out that all that plankton is the food for guess what? Many bigger creatures. Like there's a, a fish that's only found in the Galapagos called Salima. You can see that picture. They get these really dense schools, so dense that they look like black clouds underwater. They eat the plankton and then other things come and eat the fish like the penguins and the sea lions. The Salima are one of their favorite foods. But it's not just the penguins and the sea lions that eat them. It's also the birds, like the blue-footed booby. This is one of everybody's favorite in the Galapagos. And look at their feet. Have you ever seen another bird with feet like that? And everybody always wonders, gosh, why do they have blue feet? Well, they have blue feet because when they're really healthy, their feet get to be really, really bright blue. And that's a sign that they're very healthy and they would make good mates. So are you ready for this? When they're looking for a mate, a female or another male, they do something called the blue-footed booby dance. Look how goofy this is. They walk around and they say, look at my feet. I have the best blue feet. You should come and be my mate. So that's a female walking around saying, looking at my feet. And here comes a male. And the male say, no, no, yes, I have good feet too. And they waddle around, they show off their feet to each other. And it's interesting, the male, one of the ways you can tell the male from the female is they whistle and the females honk. And that's how they talk to each other. So here they're showing their feet. It's so, it's so crazy. Now there's a lot of other birds, really cool birds. This is, there's a Nazca booby. There's a, what's called a red-billed tropic bird. They're beautiful fast flying birds. And one of the top predators in the Galapagos is the Galapagos hawk. And look at that, it's, it's sitting right on one of the stop signs in a trail. They don't care about, they're not nervous at all around people. So they'll let you get very close to you. Another bird that we see in the Galapagos is called the waved albatross. And these are really big birds. Here you see in this picture is an adult next to a chick. Look how big and fluffy that chick is. Well, they have an unusual courtship dance too, just like the blue-footed boobies, you know how they show their feet. They have, these waved albatross have one of the most amazing courtship rituals in the world. So they fly out, they could be flying around for years 
they come to the Galapagos to mate and lay their eggs. But when they fly in to say hello, here's what they do. This is one of my favorites, watch this. They, they are so goofy, their heads almost look like they're doing, oh, look what they do. They clack their bills together like swords. And that's how they say hello. And then they bow to each other and then they raise up and they have their, see, watch this. They put their bills like this. They're looking at each other. That's all, this is all their way of saying, hello, are you my mate? I'd make a very good, isn't that crazy? Look, and you would see there's pairs of them all over doing that same thing. In addition to birds, we have iguanas in the Galapagos Islands and these are land iguanas. They live completely on the land. There's also marine iguanas, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. Of course, here's the giant tortoise. Again, they're pretty messy eaters. One of the cool things that's happening in the Galapagos is the National Park Service there is raising baby giant tortoises and then putting them out onto the islands where they're native to because some of the tortoises were killed by pirates and whalers who were using them for food. So now humans are coming back and helping to conserve them and to bring them back onto the islands where they were taken from and they're being, it's really successful. And in fact, now the populations are, are growing on the island. So that's a really positive thing that people are doing. There are also sea turtles in the island and there's a big population. And sometimes you can go snorkeling. I've been snorkeling with like hundred sea turtles and they, and they have their nests. And look, you can see, here's a picture. This is a great picture of baby sea turtles climbing their way out of the nest to go into the ocean. And this is another unique species in the Galapagos called the flightless cormorant. And you can see they have a courtship dance that's actually in the water. See how they swim around each other? That's how they mate and they look for each other. But the flightless cormorants where I live in Florida, we have cormorants, the same kind of bird that fly. But when the cormorants got to the Galapagos, there was so much food and there was no competition, they didn't need to fly from the island to island. And so look at their wings. They're almost like little mutated vestiges or of wings. They can't fly with them anymore. And now they use them for balance when they hop around on the rocks. They're good swimmers though. They dive in to feed on octopus and stuff. And as I mentioned before, in addition to land iguanas, in the Galapagos are the only marine iguanas in the world. And here you can see them sitting out sunbathing. They sit on the rocks to get warm. And then you can see one on the side that one is swimming and they dive in to feed on algae. And I will tell you, one of the craziest things ever is when you see a marine iguana underwater. And here's one, they, you know what they look like? They look like dinosaurs. Here is a marine iguana swimming underwater. Look at that, it was just crazy. There's sharks in the Galapagos, like they're very well known for hammerhead sharks. Here you see a, king, a school of king angelfish and one of my favorite sea stars ever. You know what we call this? chocolate chip sea star, because it looks like a chocolate chip cookie. And there are just some beautiful landscapes. And sometimes you see things that are almost unbelievable. Here is a picture of a blue footed booby sitting on a marine iguana. Can you believe that? When the, when the, the guide, the naturalist took this picture and he brought it to myself and the cruise director on the ship, we thought he had faked it. We thought it was a fake picture. And so he said, no, he really, this, I don't think anybody will ever get another picture of a blue footed booby sitting on a marine iguana. And then the other picture is this really cool picture of special kind of clouds. Those aren't waves in the ocean, those are clouds. And what's happening is warm air is rising over the island. And then up above, there's wind that's, that's shearing the tops off the waves or pushing the tops off the waves. And so you get what looks like waves, or I like to say, they look like shark fins. That's pretty cool. Now, as you heard, I am an, also an author and I love the animals of the Galapagos and the volcanoes so much that when I started a new series of books recently called The Wonderless Adventures, the very first book is called Escape Galapagos. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of the cool things that I incorporate in the story. So. There's a, I have a map in the beginning because like most explorers and adventurers, I love maps. And they're really important to figure out what the world looks like and where you are. This is, this is actually a scene of a marine iguana walking on a beach in the Galapagos. And it kind of inspired me for the beginning of the book. And I actually saw a marine iguana like this plow through a sandcastle once. And that's kind of the beginning. And look, 
up close, what does that remind you of? It kind of looked like Godzilla. And because marine iguanas eat algae, they have to get rid of the salt in their diet. And so they sit on the rocks like this and they sneeze it out their nose. So in the beginning, there's a funny scene with the, the, with the marine iguana sneezing the salt out of its nose with the main character. I also have a sea turtles and a white tip reef shark. And then this picture on the right was so funny. One time we were hiking and we walked up onto the rocks and we heard this sound. Let's see if I can do it. Let's see if you can hear it. What does it sound like? Snoring. We were like, where is that sound? There was a sea lion sleeping under the rocks and he was sleeping so hard, he was snoring. And if you look really closely, there's sea lion drool coming out of his mouth. And so I had to put that in the story because it was just so funny. There's also in the story is the main characters come upon a cave and it turns out to be a lava tunnel. Sometimes when lava flows under the ground, after it all flows into the ocean, you get an empty tube or tunnel. And there's a, one of my favorite scenes in the books where there are the characters the teens are in the tunnel and they ask the question, can new lava ever flow through old lava tubes? And you can imagine what happens next. Let's just say it gets to be a very hot situation. So one of my favorite parts in the book, and this is gonna be true in all the books and the second book in the series as well, which is, I just finished the first draft of it. And there's a section called Real Verses Made Up. And I'm gonna ask all of you out there some questions about I'm gonna read you some things and I want you to think about and will give me the thumbs up whether you think I made them up in the book or are these are things that really happened the Galapagos and I put in the book. So are they real or made up experiences? So you ready? Here we go. Someone once tried to smuggle iguanas out of the Galapagos and was caught when their luggage started moving. Okay, so Somebody tried to smuggle iguanas out of the Galapagos and they were caught when their luggage started moving. So if you think that was real, let's see a thumbs up. How many of you think that was real? How many of you think I made that up? If you're on the live stream chat, you can throw an emoji yep. in the chat too. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Real okay, it looks up? like the answer is it's real. Somebody once actually tried to smuggle a look iguanas out in their duffel bag and when the duffel bag started moving they got arrested can you believe that okay how about this one? Oh, here's one there are giant tortoise tunnels from the lowlands on the islands up to the highlands giant tortoise tunnels from the lowlands up to the highlands how many of you think i how many think that's real how many think i made it up i made it up there are little trails you can sort of see under the bushes from the tortoises, but there aren't, there aren't giant tunnels, but the characters use the tunnels. And, okay, hey, we'll do two more. A hawk dropped a snake on a visiting hiker. A hawk dropped a snake on a visiting hiker. How many of you think that's real? How many of you think that's made up? Oh, it looks kind of split. It's real. That actually happened. Some hikers were out and a hawk was, was carrying a snake and it dropped and it landed right on the person's head. Oh my goodness. Okay, last one. A woman fell onto a carpet of marine iguanas when her walking stick broke. A woman fell onto a carpet of marine iguanas when her walking stick broke. Real? How many of you think that's real? How many of you think I made that up? It's real. And I was there when it happened. It was so, so we were landing at one site and there were hundreds of marine iguanas on the ground. And we we're hiking through and this older woman put her walking stick down, it broke in half and she did a nose dive right onto the iguanas. Now we all thought, oh my gosh, she's gonna start screaming. It's going to be horrible. Nope. She stood up very calmly, brushed herself off and said, my, they're rather soft and they broke my fall. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. And she was fine. And the iguanas, they just scuttled out of the way. They don't care. So that was, that really did happen. It was really funny. So I have been so thankful. This I've gotten so many great things about the, this book. It's been so much fun to do. And I will tell you the next book 
is going to be escape. Okay, I'm sure nobody's listening. So I'll tell you a little secret. It's going to be escape Greenland. Ooh. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Tim at Reach the World so we can do some Q&A. All right, Dr. Prager, thank you so much. Wow, what a great presentation. I love the, the real or made up section. I think I got, <laughs> I got most of them right, but I, uh, I thought maybe the tor tortoise tunnels was true. It seemed possible. Um, we have some great students who are joining us online today, and I know that they're eager to ask you some questions, and I want to get right to them. And we also are going to bring in a bunch of questions from our great live stream audience. So if you have questions in the live stream audience, make sure they make it into the chat and we'll pass them along. I want to go to Sahaj first, you've been waiting so patiently. Um, why don't you unmute yourself and go ahead and ask Dr. Prager your question. Okay, so are there animals? You answered this before, so I'll do my second question. What is the best time of day to study your favorite animals? Hi, Sahaj. Well, my gosh, what is the best time of day? You know, it depends on the animal. Because remember, some animals are very active during the day, and some animals are much more active at night. So for instance, with sea lions, they tend to be more active at night or sort of in the mornings. It's hard to say. A lot of times they're sleeping during the day. So if you wanted to study like how they fish and hunt, you'd want to go at night. Um, so it really depends on the animal. The marine iguanas, on the opposite side, the marine iguanas, they dive into the ocean during the day because they, it's cold at night and they need to warm up in the sun. So if you wanted to study them diving, which I think marine iguanas are pretty cool, then you'd want to study them during the day. So it just, it all depends on the animal and the behavior you're looking to study. That is an excellent question. Fantastic question, Sahaj. Thank you so much. Annalise and Hannah Jean, would you like to ask Dr. Prager a question? We'll come back to you again, so you can decide who goes first, and then we'll come back and the other one can ask. So, um, have you ever met a Komodo dragon? Well, what a, what a great question. Are you Hannah or Annalise? I'm Annalise. She's Hannah. Jean. Okay. Hi, Annalise. I have never run into a Komodo dragon because you know what? There aren't any in the Galapagos, and I haven't been to the places in the world where there are, but they seem a little scary, but... I'm sure once you know, once you understand their behavior, it would be very, it would be fascinating actually to run into one. Okay. Good question, Annalise. Hannah Jean, would you like to ask a question? What is the most dangerous type of fish you have ever um, seen? The most dangerous type of fish I've ever seen? Well, it depends on what you think of as dangerous. So, you know, everybody always asks me about sharks and I've seen a lot of sharks in the ocean. But most of the time when sharks see you, they go, ah, and they run, you know, they swim, not run, they swim the other way. Um, one time I had a shark behave a little strangely and it, because of that, we got out of the water. But I will say maybe the most dangerous encounter I've had is at one time in the Galapagos, when I was doing that survey early on, we were in the territory of a big male sea lion and they are very territorial, meaning they're very protective of their area. And we got in to do a survey and he didn't want us there. And so what he would do is he would swim right at us and then he'd turn and he was probably like 500 pounds. So it was a very big sea lion. So he'd swim at us and then he'd turn so the water would push us back. And that was him telling us he didn't want us there. And so we got out of the water. So, you know, I've never had a problem with somebody trying to bite me or whatever because we, we try and, be prepared and watch behaviors. And so in that case, we got out of the water because he really didn't want us there and they have really big teeth. So that was that was probably my most dangerous one. Great question, Hannah Jean, thank you. Dr. Prager, Madison on the live stream, uh, I think probably in response to your talking about the early days in the Galapagos where the food was like, it's hard <laughs> to get supplies to the Galapagos right. even today. Um, but what food did you eat? And what do you eat now when you go there? <laughs> so so that, that's a really interesting question. So when we were there, let's see, we, there was only a couple restaurants on the island. And sometimes when you went and ordered food, like the meat, you weren't quite sure they would serve back then. Kind of like goat was pretty popular. Um, we ate fish and potatoes. We, I, remember, I remember we could always get 
cucumbers and carrots, <laughs> which was always funny. And they had really good chocolate. <laughs> mm. So we always had chocolate, but it was, it, you know, oh, and there was one other specialty. So there was one hotel open on the on called the Hotel Galapagos back then, and they made their own ice cream. So after a long day, of all this work, we would hike down to the hotel and get ice cream. And there was one place where we could get pizza. But now there are a lot more hotels. There are rest, more restaurants and I work on ships that get a lot more, but that still, you can't bring everything into the Galapagos. But one of the things we try and do on the ships that I work in, on is we try and rely on the local community to, they grow tomatoes and some fruit and lettuce. And we try and use as much as we can to support the local community, which I think is an important partnership so we try and get vegetables and fruits as much as we can, but it's still hard to get a lot, some other things in the Galapagos, so you still have to import some things. Do, do the Galapagos Islands have their own source of fresh water? Um, well, fresh water, fresh water is really interesting. Fresh water is kind of determines a lot of where the populations are because there's only a couple islands where they have enough fresh water to support people. And some comes in the form of rainfall and they're also wells, but there's only a couple islands and a lot of the islands are very, very dry. And it's one of the reasons people can't live there. That's a really smart question. Interesting. Um, Jack on the last stream would like to know what your favorite animal in the Galapagos is if you had to pick one. Oh, Jack, that's a really hard question. That's like asking me who my favorite child is. No, <laughs> so, hmm. Well, can I give you a couple? I love sea lions because I will tell you, one of my favorite things about the sea lions is that not only do they steal your equipment, but they'll actually come play with you. And again, I'll share a secret because I'm sure nobody's listening. Um, if there's a young sea lion in the water with you, if you dive down, if you're, if you're snorkeling, if you dive underwater and you somersault and twist around, if they want to play, they will come down and do it with you and they will swim around you and they'll twist and turn. It's so much fun and you pop up. I, I showed an older gentleman how to do this and the sea lion came and played with him and he popped up to the surface and he was laughing like a little kid. It's to see a wild animal come play with you. They're not wanting food, they, want, they just wanna play is such a wonderful experience. So sea lions are one of my favorites. Um, sometimes we see orcas or killer whales, which I love, I've seen dolphins. Um, I like the marina ganas also, I have to say. Um, Blue-footed booby, oh, see, here I go. I can't choose, maybe, <laughs> but I probably, maybe I can't lie, probably the sea lions. What do the sea lions eat? That's another question from the last year. Yep. So the sea lions principally feed on fish and squid sometimes, but a lot of that, remember I showed that picture of the Salima? There's like the general sardines or anchovies of the Galapagos and they feed a lot on the Salimas, um, but also squid and other things, principally that small fish. Okay. So how's, do you have another question you'd like to ask Dr. Prager? Yeah, wait. Um. So um, why did you choose this career path? Oh, Sasha, that's a great, that's a good question. Why did I choose it? So as a little kid, I was loved nature. I used to live in a place where there were woods and streams and trees, and I used to climb trees and roam around the woods. And I, so I always loved nature. Then in school, I was fascinated by science. I really like science. And then in high school, I was teaching swimming lessons and lifeguarding. And the guys I worked with brought scuba tanks to the pool. And they said, do you want to try these? And I said, sure. So I put the scuba tanks on and I jumped in the pool and they couldn't get me out. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever is to be underwater and just stay there. And so when I found something that I could combine scuba diving, nature and science, studying tropical science, that was really what, what did it for me. I was, I was hooked. And then I also had some really cool professors or mentors who, you know, I want to be just like them. So that was kind of how I got into it. All right. So Haj, thanks for that great question. Let's go back to Annalise and Hannah Jean. Girls, would you like to ask another question to Dr. Prager? 
Yes, sir. <laughs> so, um, what did you most, what was most enjoyable, um, what was the most enjoyable part for consulting for Moana? Oh, what was the most enjoyable part about consulting for Moana? That's pretty easy. So as part of being a consultant, I actually got to go to their studios and they had a big, audi a big auditorium, you know, where you might go see somebody make a presentation or something. And I got to give a talk to all of the like animators and the producers, all the people who are making the movie. And I gave them a talk about the ocean and how Moana could be interact with the ocean. And they asked me questions and having a really good conversation with them because they asked really good creative questions and how, you know, how, what did they want to do with regard to the ocean in the movie? That was so much fun for me. I love, because I got to learn from them about what they wanted to know. And do you remember in the movie um, the, where they showed bioluminescence, they showed the ocean glowing at night. So we talked about that. We talked about waves, you know, what, what should the ocean look like if it's calm or when the waves hit the reef. So it was really fun for me to have question and answer with that group of creative people making the movie. Annalise, I'm glad you asked that question. I wasn't going to let Dr. Prager go without telling us more about that. So you got to my question. Well, and, and so I'll just add to that. It was really funny because I told them about, so on a, when you go to an island, when you're on the side of the island where the wind is hitting, it's called windward. And when you're on the side of the island where the wind is on the other side, it's called leeward and in the movie. And I told them that in the movie, there's a line that they say, there's a fish kill on the leeward side of the island. I was like, yes, that was from what I told them. So that made me really happy too. <laughs> Great question, Annalise. Hannah Jean, would you like to ask a final question? What is your um, favorite type of fish? My favorite type of fish? Oh my gosh. Um, hmm. Well, it's kind of a fish. I love eagle rays. Do you know what an eagle ray looks like? It's kind of a type of, of like almost like a stingray, but they've got a purple back or yellow and they have white spots and sort of a pointed snout and a white bottom and they fly really gracefully through the ocean and just the other day I was out swimming in the Gulf of Mexico and one swam a big one swam right underneath me and they're really they're really graceful and they're beautiful and they're not scary at all so that's one of them. that's I have a lot of favorites but that's one of them Great question, Hannah Jean, thank you. Uh, I have two more questions from the live stream and that will bring us right about to the end of our time. Um, Jack was wondering, um, he saw the, the picture of the baby sea turtles that you showed and he's wondering if, um, if you or the Galapagos community do anything to protect those baby sea turtles. Oh, that's a really good question. Yes, in fact, the National Park in the Galapagos works and they even have volunteers who work with them to help protect the nest. One of the things they do, the, the female sea turtles, they actually, just like in Florida, they crawl up to the back of the beach and that's where they lay their eggs. So one of the things they do is they put up signs so that people don't walk over the nests and people don't disrupt them. So they really try and protect those nests so that the baby sea turtles can get out on their own and, and are safe. Yep, they're really trying hard to protect them. Fantastic. And as a final question, I know it can be challenging to get to the Galapagos Islands, considering there's several hundred miles off the coast of Ecuador. Um, why is, I know you work for a uh, consult with a cruise company too, why is taking a cruise the best way to see the Galapagos Islands? Why is that a, a popular well, way to do it? Yeah, so why is a cruise? So these cruise ships all stay in the Galapagos. So what you do, you can actually, there's an airport in the Galapagos, so you fly in and then you can get on a ship in the Galapagos. And there, you can't have anything bigger than a hundred passenger ships. So they're small cruise ships. The, the reason it's good to go on a ship is because you can go to some of the more remote islands. You can go to all the different islands. If you're going from land, there's only a couple islands you can go to. So on a cruise ship, you can go to the far Western islands. You can go to some of the closer islands to the airport. So you get to go to a lot more different sites. And what's cool is that the Western islands are a lot different than the Eastern islands because of where they are with regard to the hotspot. So you get to see a lot more if you're on a ship. Okay, good. Um, and, I, and I just wanna say they're also very well regulated. So, you know, they have to be very careful about the environment they are and the ships are very good about that. 
All right, great. I, I thought that was going to be the last question, but I want to squeeze two more in. Two more just came in. Great questions. Jack had a follow-up. He wanted to know specifically whether the journey from the sea to like the beach, whether there was anything done to protect uh, turtles from okay. seagulls and that kind of thing. So there's, there's two things. Um, one thing, just like in the United States, they, they try and where you have near town, if there are any towns nearby, and also on the ships, they ask people to turn their lights off at night because the baby sea turtles, that's the way they find their way into the ocean is by the light of the horizon. So by turning off those lights, if you have lights on shore or, or someplace else, it can misdirect the baby sea turtles. So they definitely ask them to turn off the lights. Um, and then, but I will say this, unless it's a problem with regard to the humans, you can't um, interfere. So one of the things they don't do, sometimes when the baby sea turtles go down to, from the beach to the water, there are other birds and things trying to eat them and we can't stop that. But if it's a human problem, we definitely, they definitely protect them from that. Okay, fantastic. And now as our real final question, do you, Dr. Prager, prefer studying animals in the water or on land? Do I prefer water? Oh, on land. I, I like both. I mean, most of, most of my time has been spent studying animals in the water, but my time in the Galapagos has made me much more appreciative of the land animals, especially the birds and the iguanas. So I really enjoy both. I don't, I don't think one or the other, but most of my time has been spent studying animals in the ocean. All right. Well, I think that's just about all the time we have today. I want to thank Hannah Jean, Annalise, Sahaj, thank you so much for joining us on camera today and asking your wonderful questions. I loved hearing them. Thank you to all of our students on the live stream today who shared some great questions with us as well. And thank you, of course, to Dr. Prager for coming and telling us all about the Galapagos Islands. I don't know about you all, but I wanna go and read all about <laughs> it some more too and look up some pictures. And I know there are lots of great videos and movies on the Galapagos. So if you find the Galapagos especially interesting, I know there's a lot more that you can read and Dr. Prager has really gotten us started down that path. So thank you so much, Dr. Prager. This is just the beginning of uh, Reach the World's Ocean Week special event. Tomorrow we're gonna be diving with sperm whales off Dominica and connecting with Bob, uh, Fabian Cousteau to learn about efforts to protect sea turtles in the Caribbean. So check out the complete list of upcoming Oceans Week events at at home reach the world org. And with that, I will say goodbye to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you.